guest dear viewers, welcome back to our program. As now we are going to move towards Rabbi Shimon Keys. Before we move towards him, we have got a caller. We take a short call. Hello. Yeah, hello. Yeah, who's this? Can you hear me? Who's this? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. We can, can hear you. Hear we can hear hello? you. Carry on. Yeah. My name is Manik. Okay. I'm calling you from Manchester. Okay. Now, the topic you're discussing is of special interest to me because I've studied uh, theology, okay. Abrahamic religion, for at least three, four years. And uh, I'm really surprised. And, I'm, and the reason why I decided to go, I mean, I'm doing a PhD now, okay. and because I was really shocked by the disunity between the Jews, the Muslims, and the Christians, and the uh, for, uh, I mean, at, at the present moment, the Christians and Jews are on, on the same side. The Muslims are alone on the other side, yeah? So I, I would like to just, um, uh, you know, I mean, tell, tell you my opinion. Now, I'm, I'm Indian, basically. My name is Manik. Okay. And Mahatma Gandhi, he had said that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Good. So do you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. An eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Exactly. So we are talking about what's going on in Gaza now. But can we try to remember how this all started? Because three teenagers, innocent teenagers, just like you know our, our children, yeah, they were trekking or something, and they were caught and killed by Hamas or the Palestinians. And that's when there was a reaction. But my so friend, thank you very much for your views. It might be to you, but unfortunately, not to us that the children were killed by teenagers. The question is, if Hamas killed three teenagers, what about Israeli force, IDF? They're using Palestinian children as a shield. By the way, Thank you very much for your call. Now we'd like to move towards Rabbi Shimon Keys. Yes, Rabbi, first of all, thank you very much to join us today. And how would you express the current situation? Well, as a religious Jew, uh, somebody who believes fully in, in Judaism, which condemns the Zionist ideal, so I, I look at the situation as, as basically yet another a uh, catastrophe which has come out of the Zionist movement, both for Jewish people and for Palestinian people who are, the, who are subject to whatever the effects of, of Zionism. And uh, I take this opportunity to, in the name of Judaism and in the name of the religion which has been, which has been distorted into nationalism uh, in order to justify these inhumane actions, in the name of this religion where I, on behalf of uh, hundreds of thousands of Jews and over the world are condemning these actions and uh, and speaking on behalf of the Torah to say that there's, there's absolutely no justification for it. Can I just ask a quick question? Yeah, you um, can. It's often cited by many people in uh, supporters of Israel that there's explicit sanction or command actually for uh, Jewish people to form a state in Israel and there's often biblical justification given to the actions that have been taking yeah. place, that God has prom promised us this land in this particular place. So how would you just respond to that? And um, perhaps there we can start to try to draw a wedge between what we consider as Judaism or the Jewish belief and Zionism, Zionism as, a, as an ideology. Well, firstly, I want to bring out uh, how ridiculous it is to use Judaism to justify Zionism, given that the... the root of Zionism comes from, from Theodor Herzl, who was probably the biggest example of a self-hating Jew who ever lived. And before he came up with the idea to create a Jewish state, his idea was actually to... Uh, he had a, um, a surreal idea that Jews, all, the, all the Jews would take their children and convert them to Christianity, and that that would solve the problem of anti-Semitism, or as he phrased it, the Jewish problem in his diary. He, he wrote, it's a Jewish problem. Um, and they never ever focused on, on Palestine as a land uh, originally because their ideal uh, state which they wanted to create was not for the Jewish people, it was for 
select intellectual cultural uh, people. Um, the only reason that they chose Palestine as their land is because later the, the movement developed into an ideal not only to create a state, a safe haven, but also to try and secularize as many Jewish people as they could and to try and convert the Jewish nation, which was, has always been a religious entity, into a nationalist entity. Um, the same way that when reform started, it wasn't only for their own benefit, they also, made, they also went to the government and made many decrees against religious people in order to try and, uh, on an industrial scale, secularize them. Also Zionism was with the same intent. So they chose Palestine in order to, to arouse uh, uh, people to support them. They took this, uh, the, the longing which the Jewish people have, have had for their redemption for so many hundreds of years, almost 2,000 years, and they, they put it together with the nationalist idea and, uh, and through arousing anti-Semitism and through using anti-Semitism as a way of, of trying to hammer into the hearts of people that they, this is the only way they'll be safe, they eventually were able to blind masses of Jews into believing that this was some kind of a manifestation of the redemption we've been waiting for. But as I mentioned, it comes from a completely secular uh, ideal. And so um, to go after everything has happened and then correct it uh, and, and justify it using the Torah is, is, a, is such a ridiculous idea. If, it, if the Torah justifies it, then it would have been from the Torah in the beginning. You can't take a secular ideal and afterwards come back and say that it's from the Torah. But apart from that, I want to clarify what the Jewish connection with the land of Israel is uh, in order to, to destroy this idea that it's a nationalist connection. The Jewish people were, were given this land uh, on a condition it says 14 times in the, in, the, in the five books of Moses is given on the condition that they would keep the Torah there. And, if, and it says if they won't keep the Torah there, then they will be denied the land and they will be exiled. And we were warned by prophets when we were in this land that we, if we will not repent, we will be exiled. We didn't repent. And everyone knows historical fact that the Jews were, who were living in this land were sent into a diaspora. And that's the situation that we've been for the last 2,000 years. And once we were sent into this exile, the Torah tells us that we are forbidden to uh, go en masse by force back into this land. We're forbidden to rebel against nations. This is a clear um, oath in the Talmud. It says we're forbidden to rebel against the nations and we're forbidden to try and end this exile which we've been put in by force. And apart from that, everyone knows that killing innocent people, stealing is... is uh, fundamentally forbidden in Judaism. So all of these, all of these uh, justifications that people bring for Zionism uh, from Judaism is, is, is a... Zionist Judaism is a complete contradiction in terms. And the only way which the, which the religious Zionists, like uh, some, of the, some of the people in the parliament there or the settlers who are making these illegal settlements came out, the only way that, they, that their movements were able to begin were, were that the secular ideals came into their camps and mixed with, the, with, them, with their religious ideals and, and, and they strayed away from the authentic uh, Jewish ideal. But uh, Judaism has stayed the same and is still against all of these ideas and cannot be used and hijacked, uh, especially by a secular government which, which transgresses Judaism in, in, in thousands of other ways in every aspect of their state. It cannot be used to justify all of these uh, atrocities which are being done. Thank you very much. Now I would like to move towards Dr. Mustafa. Then afterwards, I will move towards Glenn Seekers. For Dr. Seba, I want to ask, Palestinian struggle for freedom is often defined with militancy and terrorism. We always hear that Israel government saying we are fighting terrorism. How would you take this question? Well, I think that's... Um complete uh, propaganda really and completely shifting the debate in a direction that is uh, very unhelpful and it confuses a lot of people. If you actually look at the history of the conflict uh, and see where terrorism kind of begins and so many people object and say you know are you against the existence of the state of Israel I think that's not even the question. The question is how did the state actually come about and just in the period of about seven or eight years, well, between 1941 and 48, there were almost 250 terrorist attacks 
committed by Zionists, what were actually labelled as terrorist groups by the British, by the UN and by the US. These were terrorist groups operating inside of what was then the British Mandate of Palestine. Everybody is well aware of the bombing of the King David Hotel, which killed around 91 people, in that there were British, Arabs, Jewish as well. And this was carried out by a terrorist organisation called Ergun. And uh, Menachem Begin at the time was referred to by the British as the number one terrorist. And this same individual goes on to become the Prime Minister of Israel and also receives a Nobel Peace Prize. And we're quite well aware of <laughs> other people receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, like Barack Obama also, yeah. who was also, people say that he should have it rescinded from him. So if you look at the history of these different organisations, I mean, if you look at Lehi or Stern Gang, as it's often known, that was a self-described terrorist group. They actually referred to themselves as terrorists. And there were other Jews in the world, not only uh, Muslims, Christians, Arabs and so on, there were Jews in the world that were also condemning these individuals, like Albert Einstein as well, who was quite categorical in his condemnation of uh, Begin and these other terrorist groups. Stern Gang not only was a self-described terrorist group, it in fact uh, tried to make allegiances with Nazi Germany. Might surprise so many people. Uh, making alliances with Nazi Germany under the pretext or justification that um, the British were actually worse than the Nazis. And you'll see this pattern emerging in so many of these groups that were actually fighting to establish a state. And it's these very same groups that then merge and form what is today the Israeli uh, Defence Force. So I think this whole notion of um, labelling um, the victims as terrorists is absolutely absurd because it's been well documented by Israeli historians as well, who are pro-Israeli like Benny Morris, about the systematic ethnic cleansing, the massacres that took place in the areas. Uh, Benny Morris even talks about the rape of women that happened in many villages, the Nakba, which everybody's familiar with, which is actually banned to commemorate or remember the Palestinian catastrophe of what happened in 48 is actually illegal in Israel. Uh, and when even Israelis or Jews try to do it, then there are consequences for them. So this whole notion of the right to defend itself against terrorism is, is an absolute logical absurdity because Israel is the occupier and under international law in fact it has a duty to protect the people that it's occupying not the other way around I mean the people being occupied for 60 70 years do not have a duty to protect Israel Israel is not actually defending itself it's defending the occupation because the settlements continue uh, the gross violations of international law uh, UN resolutions which are amounting to close to 80 this is what's happening. Uh, the settlements continue, land grabs continue, uh, violations, human rights violations, war crimes continue. And a response to that then can't be called terrorism. And then you can't take the name of a right to self-defense. There is no right to self-defense when you're defending an illegal occupation. Thank you very much. Now we have got a caller. He's Sheikh Abdul Salam, the Grand Sheikh of Palestine, who's in Saudi at the moment. We would like to get his point of view. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Can you phone me through the phone, please? Much better. The sky give not continuous line. Yes, yeah, Sheikh. But the, okay but the thing is, the, okay the line is good now. Yeah. We are lacking time at the moment. So I would like to ask quickly, what is your point of view on the current crisis or the current, I, current conflict between Gaza and Palestine? Uh, this is a long story. You want me to make the Atlantic Ocean in a very small string yes. and give it to you, which is impossible. Simple. I cannot hear you now. The line is good now. I cannot, good. I cannot hear you. Hello? Yes, Shaq, we can hear you. You carry on. Yes. Uh, the problem, uh, let me say, very simple from the end. Muslims like to make peace. But unfortunately, the, the Zionism don't want me peace. I do appreciate and respect what the rabbi just said, that there, is a diff there are differences between Jude Jude Jewish and Judaism as a religion and Zionist as a political movement. Zionist is employing every single aspect, religious, politics, Cruelness, anything to achieve the Zionist goal. 
nothing to do with religion. Muslims like to make, and the Muslims compromise, to give 78% of the homeland of Palestinians in order to make peace. But the Zionist movement doesn't want to make peace. Zionist movement put in their eyes from Nile to for the big river. For us. This is the problem. The problem is those who are receiving the or the uh, the receiving the authority and the decision makers are the most dangerous people for the human being, for justice, for a human being values. What kind of justice justify such kill and such demolished houses, innocent people, even they bomb the the innocent civilian people in the United Nations institutions in Gaza, which the schools now there. So what, what do you want me to say about two months bombing? It's not 35 days because it was before another 20 days in West Bank. They used to go to every single house kill for the three kidnapped people and too many reports speak that these, can, these kidnappers are criminal Israelis inside Israel. Nothing to do with Palestine, nothing to do with Palestinians, even nothing to do with Hamas. I don't know who kidnapped them, but the problem we know if we live in the pleasant meaning of justice in life, which everybody on this earth understand what justice means, what fighting the crime means we must go catch the person who did the crime and punish the person who did the crime. Israel knows who burned Muhammad Khadir in Al-Quds and they released them and they speak and they wrote about themselves on the Facebook that they are proud they did this, 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 this in details and the Israeli court doesn't Bring them to the trial. It is, it is not one word. What is happening? Absolutely cruelness to the whole human being, demolishing the meaning of religion, demolishing the meaning of Torah, demolishing the meaning of heaven, demolishing the meaning of, uh, the meaning of God Almighty. What kind of God their brain make to excuse what they are doing? There are point. many things to be said, but I want specific questions so I can answer academic, specific, uh, uh, supplied with evidence, uh, and as we should say, proofs and adilla. Thank you very much, Shaq, for your patience and staying with us on call. Thank you very much for your call. And I would like to mention, I was speaking to Glenn on the way to studio, and he mentioned that the children who have been kidnapped from Israel, Hamas has not taken the responsibility for that. Indeed, Hamas takes responsibility for the actions they do. By the way, nobody knows what is happening. There might be political reasons behind them. By the way, I would like to move towards Glenn now. Glenn, I want to ask, are anti-Semitism and criticism of Israel same? No, assuredly not. And we're very committed to drawing a distinction between our right to criticize Israel and uh, the issue of anti-Semitism. In fact, we go further that, uh, than that and say that if uh, Israel succeeds in identifying all Jews throughout the world with itself and its current horrendous actions. I mean, let's make no bones about this. The crimes Israel is committing at the moment are unbelievable. And if the world is going to believe that it's being done in the name of all Jews, the anger that that generates, the antipathy that generates towards Israel, then gets associated with all Jews. And that feeds into a rise of anti-Semitism. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then Israel 
having generated that anti-Semitism, can say, we are desperately trying to secure the security of Israel in what we are doing because of the rise of anti-Semitism. So it's a self-fulfilling process. And we say, that's not on. What they're doing is avowedly not in our name. Israel cannot put itself in an ivory white tower in a position where it cannot be morally judged and criticised because if it achieves that, then it can do anything it likes without any criticism at all. Now, no human being has the right to do that. So that's our position and that's why we think us as an organisation being active in the movement for Palestinian rights is so vital because I get up and speak at uh, the demonstration, other people from our organisation get up and speak at these big demonstrations, 150,000 in Hyde Park, probably 50,000 the week before, 50,000 the week before that, um, and we say, not in our name, and we say that to the whole crowd, and we say that on our website, and we say it on programmes like this, and we let people know that what they have to do is not to fall for the Israeli Hasbro, that means propaganda, but to think clearly about it, that it's a question of the Israeli state justifying its expansion, seeking to establish Eretz Israel, that is Israel from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, mm. and in the process of that, they want to destroy the will of the Palestinians, they want to herd them into townships, and to produce uh, a cheap market and cheap labour. Palestinians already humiliated building the settlements that take their own land from them. They want to uh, disarm them. They want to control them completely. That's a model of apartheid South Africa, except, as exactly. Desmond Tutu said, worse. Yes. And the solution is the South African solution, is boycott, dis disinvestment and sanctions. And it's supremely powerful because it's about economics and finance and money. And it's supremely peaceful. It's no violence, physical violence towards anyone because we condemn as an organisation all violence to anyone. Um, and we have had some considerable successes with this. Um, South American countries have uh, suspended trade with Israel while the conflict is on. Banks in um, uh, Holland and pension funds, uh, one of the biggest pension funds uh, has decided that it will not invest in anything where there are investments in the occupation. Uh, in this country, we stopped a, uh, a big Israeli multinational company called Veolia getting control of the whole of the business of waste disposal for North London, a £4.9 billion contract, because through our lawyers, we were able to establish that they didn't have a right to be on the list of companies tending for that contract. Bill Gates Foundation has made a similar pronouncement that it won't invest in the occupation and the movement is gaining momentum. Uh, it's just been uh, revealed that uh, MPs in this country were bombarded with 58,000 emails and letters from their constituents, which is why uh, Lady Varsi has a base, why she's standing on principle uh, not just as an individual, but lots of people agree with her, and why the British government has just now, just I think it was yesterday, announced that if the con conflict continues, they will withdraw exports uh, licenses for arms to be sold to Israel. Now, that's more symbolic than uh, anything else, because, of course, while there's a peace process going on at the moment, no fighting, Israel will be very quickly rearming itself. Um, but the point is that the government felt obliged to do that and that's because of the strength of public opinion and it goes back to your point about the uh, Iraq demonstrations, the anti-war demonstrations, one, two million people on the street. No effect immediately then, you're absolutely right. Um, and Blair's personally profited from the whole process ever since. 
but it did mean that this government was not able to go to war in Syria because of the fear of the reaction. And that meant that he couldn't say to Obama, I'm behind you. Obama had to go to Congress and he lost that initiative. So there was a knock-on effect there. But the difference between Iraq and Palestine is that the Palestinians started a boycott movement which has become international and it is gaining effect. And I think that uh, protective edge, this last dreadful assault on Gaza, is uh, the equivalent of Sharpville in South Africa, where the white regime mowed down a peaceful demonstration and that opened the eyes of the world and turned public opinion against South Africa and gave a boost to the boycott movement. And right. I think that's the way forward for Palestine. Okay, just to conclude in one minute, hmm. what are the practical steps towards this? Well, the practical steps for boycott is that people should look carefully at what they're buying in the shops. But on the other hand, practical steps to resolve this problem, to resolve this conflict, Gaza-Israel conflict. Well, there are two things that will resolve this conflict. One is, obviously, if Israel's actions become counterproductive to American interests in the Middle East. So when Israel was about to launch a preemptive strike on uh, Iran's nuclear uh, program, America said, don't do it, because you're messing with American policy, foreign policy. They knew that it would create another war in the Middle East. So America has the say-so, and it's because of American economic and political interests in the Middle East that they have the say-so. Thank and uh, the second thing is that um, if Israel is going to make a peace process, a meaningful peace, not an Oslo peace process, but a viable one for the Palestinians, it's only going to do that. Fine words are water off a duck's back for them. It'll only do it if there's a strong boycott movement. And it is developing. I think we're on course. I may be wrong because predictions in politics are notoriously unreliable. Thank you. But I think we're, we're on the way. Thank you very much. Tariq, I just want to quickly ask, are you going to raise this question in the council? Yes, I intend to do that. And um, already momentum is gathering in terms of uh, uh, speaking to parliamentarians about this issue. Some have already been spoken to. Some we are in the process of arranging to speak to others. So certainly the movement is continuing in terms of raising awareness as far as, you know... Uh, you need to do that because he mentioned there was loads of processions. 50,000 yeah. people, 150,000 people, no conclusion. Yeah. Because God has given you a power at the moment. So I will request you if yeah. you could do that in the council. I'm not sure how much raised. power a council, local councillor has, but... But <laughs> if you would make a cre create an awareness what? among the council... Yeah. And it would definitely go far. Yes, it? absolutely. At the moment, we're on break. We're, we're on holiday at the moment. We have been for the past, I think, month or so. Uh, but when we get back, when we have a first meeting in the council, I intend to raise this as an issue. That's first fine. First full council meeting. Brilliant. Days. Now, I, I would like to move towards Rabbi Shimon Keys. Just to conclude in one minute, what would you say, what would you suggest is an appropriate way to end this conflict between Gaza and Israel? Well, um, our group is not a political entity to be able to make political moves. Certainly, I support and we encourage boycott. Like uh, our friend mentioned before, in South Africa, this was one of the things that made a big difference. And it can make a big difference here as well. And uh, I want to bring out a point as well that raising awareness um, that this is not a Jewish-Muslim conflict will also break lots of uh, the Zionism which has spread across to Jews that, which feel like they've been put in a situation where uh, the state of Israel is the only, the only um, safe haven for them and this is what the state of Israel gets a lot of its support from this because they're, they're, they're brainwashed to think that the state of Israel is protecting them and that uh, the, any Muslim anti-Zionism is immediately uh, put in the same box as anti-Semitism and the propaganda uh, depicting the Palestinians as, uh, as violent people and all of these things. Once you, once you bring out that this is not, the, the conflict doesn't sit on, this, on these concepts, it's, it's uh, to raise awareness of the true history of the oppression of the Palestinians under the Zionists, and which, which brings out the real cause for the frustration of the Muslim world. This will wake uh, many people up who otherwise would have supported Zionism, 
and they will realize that it's not for their good to support Zionism. It's it's for uh, the supporting Zionism even for Jews is one of the yeah. most destructive uh, actions. That's fine, and I would like to mention, like as you say, you're not political organization. Yes. If this would happen in Islam or Muslims, all of the scholars would stand against them. They would declare them as an action. Yes. against Islamic teachings. Yes. So definitely they would be out of the bounds of Islam. That's the perfect conclusion which you could do as well. C declaring Zionism or Zionist out of the bounds of Jews if yes, they're going in the province of Bible. Yes. By the way, I would like to move towards Dr. Sab. Dr. Sab, how would you <coughs> conclude this in one minute? I you know, just agree with the rest of the panel and the really good suggestions. We just got two minutes. So. Yeah, the really good suggestions that they've made. I mean, it's basically reaching out to all people of humanity, people of morality, and that transcends the different religions that we belong to. That's not to say, as the caller was saying, in some sense, that is it, it's not really religious, it's a humanitarian issue, but if your humanitarian concerns are inspired by your faith, by your religion, or by whatever morality that is, then that's fine. And I think that's going to be the strongest thing. We know that America, with the Snowden leaks that have just come out, have not only provided intelligence um, to the uh, Israelis in the current conflict in Gaza, but they've also supplied them with arms, um, uh, with intelligence, and full support, and the same is happening with the intelligence services here. And you can't expect anything from the Arabs. I mean, people say we shouldn't rely on the Americans anyway because they've never tended to be on the side of Muslims. But what are the Arab leaders doing? Well, the truth is that the Arabs and the Americans are working together, both of them, against the Palestinians. And we know that Saudi Arabia and Egypt, CC's Egypt, have uh, fully backed uh, the um, demolishment of the uh, Palestinian resistance, for example. And they want to see the end of the resistance. So do the Americans, um, so do the British. So we can't really rely on our governments to take any action. The only thing that can happen is if there's massive public opinion across the globe that can put pressure on these governments. And that, that does mean that it's Muslim, Christians, Jews, all people coming together to form a mass global movement, similar to what happened in South Africa, but I think the situation is even more dire now, as has been explained by many people, that like this is like by Noam Chomsky and other people, that it's beyond apartheid now. And the only way it's going to happen is if people of humanity, of morality, all come together and put ex you know, exert their pressure, um, either on these governments and also on a private and individual level with the uh, boycott movement that, uh, that Glenn just mentioned. Muslim world can do that but not supplying the oil to the West, I must say. <laughs> I mean, from the beginning, it was the Arab leaders, you have to remember, there were Arab leaders like King Faisal and, and some press TV are saying even the Saudis that promised Israel. They made promises as well to Israel that they can have the land and they won't oppose them. And King Faisal expressing his disdain for the Palestinian people when he gave Wiseman the promise. So it begins very, very early on. It's not just the British who we can blame for this or the American. Our own Arab leaders are just as well to blame for the current crisis. Well, thank you very much. I would thank all of the panel, learned panel, which includes Dr. Mustafa Beg, Glenn Seekers, Barista Tariq Khan, and Shimon Keys. Thank you very much for your arrival here today to give us some time and to share love for the Palestinians. And I would like to conclude in the words to my limited understanding, so to my limited knowledge. Mandela says one, the freedom of Africa is in the freedom of Palestine. So we need to stand up, unite, and create an awareness among governments of the nations. So they should take action against Israel or they could stop this war through peace words as Glenn has mentioned. They should reach to an agreement and there won't be any war. And the message of all of the religions are love and peace. I think religious organizations need to stand up and tell these Zionists what all they are doing is against the provenience of Judaism. Thank you very much for watching this program. We will see you next time.